Our story begins with our protagonist Zhuang Wu learning to code and design on his own. He didn't have a team and single-handedly designed a game. Tiredly, he leaned back in his chair, assuring himself that in two more months he would be done, and his efforts would undoubtedly bring him fortune. Suddenly, his phone rang. It was Ma Chun Chun. He answered the call and Ma demanded to know when he intended to pay his rent. He asked her for a few more days, promising that his game would earn him substantial money by then. Ma reminded him that she had been hearing this for three years. Only ten people had bought his previous game, Doomsday, and the sales of P-Man were even worse as she was the only buyer. He replied, somewhat sadly, that it was simply because they lacked good taste. Ma retorted that he was the one with poor taste and warned him that if he didn't pay by tomorrow, he should prepare to be evicted. Checking his balance, he found he only had 558 RMB. The sight was frustrating, but he figured if he was thick-skinned enough, Ma wouldn't be able to do much. Resolute, he began typing again, planning to speed up his work and finish the game quickly. Suddenly, his computer shut down and a surge of numbers appeared on the screen. Messages about designing the monster's image, finalizing plots, adding more codes, and fixing bugs popped up, surprising him. Confused by what was happening, and why his design seemed alive, he received a warning that the system was overloaded. Then, his computer case crashed down, smoke billowing out. He thought with despair that his life was over, but he noticed a strange light still glowing on his computer screen. The screen displayed an interface announcing the release of a new fantasy world. Releasing platform is on Earth. The progress bar started at 15%, jumped to 30, and soon it reached 100%. Upon completion, bright lights emanated from his computer. He tilted his head to avoid the blinding beam and his surroundings started to shake uncontrollably. Realizing it was an earthquake, he rushed to the door, flung it open, and dashed out of the building. Once outside, he was stunned to see trees erupting from the ground, crawling up the buildings. He wondered if he was dreaming because the trees looked strangely familiar. The crowd around him was panicking, trying to make sense of what was happening. Someone pointed to the sky, exclaiming about an unidentified flying monster colliding with a helicopter. The collision caused the helicopter to explode and both it and the monster plummeted to the ground. As people shouted and fled from the falling debris, a little girl was pushed over and fell to the ground. As she opened her eyes, she saw the monster hissing at her. He was stunned to see it because it was the monster he had designed. Its name was a hippogriff, with an eagle's upper body, a horse's hindquarters, and feathers as hard as steel. Its danger level was sea level, and its special ability was the ripple scream. The hippogriff stood up and screamed angrily at the people. He ran toward it, knowing it was a bad situation. The hippogriff opened its mouth while looking at a little girl. She closed her eyes in fear. Fortunately, our protagonist grabbed her in time and dragged her away while the hippogriff started to use its ripple scream. He covered the little girl's ears, knowing that he needed to, but he felt pain when he heard the scream. Suddenly, the ground shook uncontrollably. The hippogriff stopped when it heard something running towards it. When the hippogriff looked back, it saw red shining eyes coming at it. It was another furious monster. Then, it stabbed the hippogriff before it could even react. He saw this and realized that it was the monster named Unicorn Wolf. It was the overlord of the prairie, its horn sharp and strong. Also, its danger level was B level, and its ability was lightning strike. He slowly closed his eyes, guessing that he wouldn't have to pay the rent anymore, then collapsed. Later, he opened his eyes when he heard a beeping sound and was surprised to see that he was in a hospital. He sat up and saw the little girl he had saved. He wondered if all those things he had just seen were real. He grabbed the remote near his bed and turned on the TV in front of him. Lai Zhaomeng, the reporter, announced that currently, the height of the trees was over 5,000 meters and that they were just at the tree's waist when something flew towards them. It attacked the reporter, causing the camera to turn off. In the next news segment, the reporter informed everyone that professionals had already dived down 1,000 meters into the giant hole, and that they should see what they had discovered. The camera spotted the red glaring eyes, and it attacked the cameraman, causing the camera to turn off once again. On the next channel, the reporter told everyone that it was an emergency announcement. In response to the crisis of humans, they begged the players to report their identities at the player's lobby. He wondered why they needed players, then remembered the hippogriff, unicorn wolf, sky tree, and abyssal pit. It made him wonder why they looked exactly like the settings in the new fantasy world he was creating. Suddenly, an interface popped up in front of him. It showed our protagonist's name, Zhuang Wu, that he was at level 1, and his profession was game designer and PC. Currently, he didn't have a title, his HP was 100, MP was 0, strength was 9, agility was 11, intelligence was 12, perception was 9, undistributed was 0, and a note stated that the average human had 10 attribute points. Wu wondered if the game he designed had invaded the earth. He clicked his inventory, but the interface showed a note that NPCs like him were unable to use the storage panel and skill panel. 
He tried to click the other buttons, but the interface showed a note that he was unable to use the change profession system. He was sad because he thought he was a peasant, and as a game designer, he didn't have an identity. Suddenly someone opened the door, and he immediately lay back in bed when he saw a girl. His landlord, named Ma Chun Chun, told him to stop pretending and reminded him that the TV was still playing. He awkwardly asked Ma why she was there, but Ma asked him back if he thought she wanted to come and explained that the hospital had informed her to come. Wu told Ma that he knew she treated him the best, but Ma told him that it was just because if he died, no one would pay her rent. The little girl woke up and looked at him, trying to recognize him. Then, the little girl hugged him happily, calling him dad and told him that he was finally awake. Ma angrily asked him if he already had a child, but he shouted at Ma to let him explain. Later, after explaining everything, Ma understood and told him that the little girl might have lost her memory, so she would help the little girl register her lost child status. Before the little girl's parents could pick her up, he would have to take care of her. He seized the opportunity and asked Ma if she could lower the rental fee. Ma replied, sure, and angrily grabbed the receipt. She then told him to pay her the medical fee first, which totaled 8,000 RMB. This left him stunned and shocked because of the price. After the disaster occurred, humans resorted to using nuclear bombs against the sky tree and the abyssal pit. However, they failed to triumph. Instead, they lost control of the sky and relinquished half of their territory. Now, the fate of mankind rests in the hands of the players. Half a year later, in Zhuang Wu's house, Wu observed a little girl trying to lift a shield, offering it to him joyfully while calling him dad. He patted Meng Meng's hair, reassuring her that she was a good girl. Meng Meng was a temporary name that Wu had given her. He had attempted to use this name online to locate Meng's parents. Although he received responses, they were from individuals wanting to adopt Meng or someone pretending to be an uncle, claiming that Meng's parents had perished in an accident. He resolutely asked the man for Meng's real name, but the man retorted, asking him if the little girl's name wasn't Meng Meng. He further claimed that thanks to Zhuang's report, their city had apprehended a large group of child kidnappers. Six months had passed and Meng's memory was still fragmented, with her parents yet to come and collect her. Fortunately, Meng was a well-behaved child who often helped with chores, though she often ended up accidentally breaking things. This infuriated Ma, resulting in Wu being charged for repair fees, 1,000 RMB for the television and 3,000 RMB for house repairs. Wu had once considered sending Meng to an orphanage, but when she tearfully called him dad, he was moved to comfort her, telling her that they should go home. The new fantasy world comprised two main monster areas, the underground and the wilderness. The underground monsters were notably formidable, while the wilderness monsters were marginally weaker. Wu arrived at a prairie near a city. He placed his shovel on the ground and began to dig, not stopping until he had reached the hidden monster. The creature lunged into the air to attack him, but Wu defended himself with his shield. He then gripped his shovel tightly and struck the monster, breaking the creature's horn in the process. A notification popped up, announcing that he had killed a jackalope. However, as an NPC, he was unable to gain experience points. After completing the jackalope hunt mission, a notification appeared indicating he had slain over 10,000 horned jackalopes, earning him the title Bunny Slayer. Exhausted, he lay on the ground, relieved that his task was finally over. Being a game designer, Wu not only created plots for players, but also devised many for NPCs. Originally, the Bunny Slayer title was specifically intended for an NPC. According to the plot, an ordinary NPC, after slaying more than 10,000 and jackalopes would trigger a hidden plot and emerge as the hero of the new fantasy world. Alongside the players, they would embark on a crusade to slay the Demon King. Half a year ago, after Zhuang Wu discovered the NPC on the prairie, he endeavored to hinder him from hunting jackalopes. Regardless, the NPC continued to slaughter the creatures. Wu mocked the NPC, warning him not to blame him for the consequences of his own actions. Wu dug traps in the prairie to ensnare the NPC, used jackalopes as bait to tire him, and even lured a fang boar to the prairie. The creature attacked the NPC and flung him away. As a result, the NPC ceased to appear on the prairie. Consequently, the world's hero was on the brink of replacement. Later, in the S-City player's lobby, many players of varying levels gathered. Wu barged in, holding a dead bunny, which stunned the crowd. As he walked through the lobby, the people discussed his title, Jackalope Slayer, and criticized his cowardice for merely hunting the lowest level monsters instead of venturing into the underground dungeons. Wu was irked, not being a player but a game designer. He stopped at Lao Zhang's Spicy Rabbit Head shop. Lao Zhang, the owner, was known for his special dish, Spicy Rabbit Head. This item, once consumed, would increase a player's movement speed by 5% for 5 minutes. He informed Lao that he had acquired the jackalope he sought. 
However, Lao, whose business had been struggling lately, offered him some rabbit heads instead. Wu accepted the plate of rabbit heads with gratitude, oblivious to a girl observing him. The NPC, Lai Kuya, revealed herself, and he was surprised to see her. He was elated that a key character had finally appeared. Being the game's designer, he was aware that Lai Q was not an ordinary NPC but one of the few gods in the game. According to the plot, after killing 10,000 jackalopes, Kyuya should consider him as determined and strong-willed, thereby blessing him to become a hero. He addressed Kyuya as a goddess and implored her to bestow her blessing quickly. However, she questioned why he had killed the rabbits, which she found adorable, leaving him confused about the apparent plot deviation. Kyuya, fuming, labeled him the bunny slayer. She grabbed his hand, scolded him for the mass killing of the cute creatures, and then proceeded to violently throw him to the ground. As she vented her anger by kicking him, even Lao, the owner of the spicy rabbit head shop, was too frightened to intervene. Another player noticed the commotion and recognized Kyuya. They wondered whether Wu had provoked her or harassed her inappropriately. Wu, being assaulted, was perplexed, wondered shouldn't he have become the hero, had the game altered itself during this time. Suddenly, a notification popped up. It revealed that, due to his massacre of jackalopes, he was cursed by the goddess Lai Kyuya. As a result of the curse, he was now ostracized by the world, stripped of his human identity, and transformed into a demon. The interface opened his character panel, showing his new race as demon. His current HP was 35 out of 200, MP was 100 out of 100, strength was 13, agility was 15, stamina was 14, intelligence was 12, accuracy was 13, and he had zero undistributed points. Wu was astounded but not entirely displeased, as the initial attributes for a demon were higher than those of a hero. He thought the ordeal might have been worth it. With tears in his eyes, Wu professed his love to Kyuya, but she dismissed him as freaking trash. He looked up and spotted something he was not supposed to say, prompting Kyuya to kick him hard, reducing his health to 30. Later, after recomposing himself, Wu realized that becoming a player unlocked previously inaccessible functions. He was pleased as it provided more convenience and spared him the burden of carrying many items during hunts. He opened the skill list and saw demon imitation at level 1. This skill frightened weaker demons into immobility. It had a cooldown of 60 minutes and required 20 MP. The other skill, Demon Transformation at level 1, enabled him to assume a demon form, significantly boosting all attribute points. Its duration was 30 seconds, the cooldown was 24 hours, and it required 80 MP. His new race had talents that provided extremely high agility and defense, specialized in dual-wielding weapons, and had excellent night vision. A notification revealed that demons could not change professions at the player lobby. Upon reaching level 10, he would receive a profession-changing mission. Furthermore, the system would announce his new race to the world. It asked him if he wished to hide his name. Wu clicked yes, and a notification immediately congratulated the S-City unknown player for being cursed by the goddess and obtaining a rare race identity, thereby unlocking a hidden plot. Other players also saw this and couldn't believe it. They, too, desired to be cursed by a goddess and planned to congratulate the anonymous player, unaware that Wu was the player in question and was nearby. Some even wanted to supplicate themselves to the goddess, which amused Wu. Meanwhile, in the Player Management Association's building, the person seated in the chair, President Lei Q of the S-City Management Association, also received the notification about the new race. He asked his secretary if anything major had occurred in their city recently. The secretary responded that their city's Thunder Dragon Guild had recently cleared a B-rank underground dungeon. Lai Bingyun, the secretary, assured Lei that her reliable sources confirmed the guild hadn't interacted with any goddess, and the Cloud Soar Guild and Blue Goat Guild hadn't recently attacked any dungeons. Lei inquired about any unusual events in the player lobby, and Bingyun mentioned a player known for hunting jackalopes had angered an NPC and suffered a severe beating. When Lei asked if it involved a kid named Zhuang Wu, Bingyun was surprised asking if Lei was also keeping an eye on Wu. Lei explained that he happened to know Wu's father, then directed Bing Yun to locate Wu when she had time. As Wu was known to be scared of dungeons, Lei suggested that she recruit him into their backup team. Bing Yun affirmed that she understood. Later, in the prairie, he held two shovels while eyeing a jackalope burrowed in the ground. Suddenly, it sprang from its hole and charged at him. As it neared, he skillfully swung his shovel down, thumping it onto the ground. A notification popped up, indicating he'd slain the jackalope, awarding him 10 experience points. Now at level 1 with 10 out of 100 experience, he felt a wave of satisfaction at finally gaining experience. In past encounters with jackalope hordes, his only choice had been to flee. This time, however, he was eager to face them head on. After his transformation into a demon, all his attributes had improved, making the jackalope's movements seem painfully slow. When one of the jackalopes attacked, he easily blocked it, smugly informing it that its efforts were too slow, he could anticipate its every move. 
he seized its ears, grinning ominously as it collapsed. The subsequent notification revealed that he'd leveled up to level 2. Gazing at the defeated jackalope, he recalled his racial abilities. Without hesitation, he activated his demon intimidation skill, shocking the jackalopes and making them faint from fear. He vanquished the prone jackalopes and added them to his inventory, simultaneously leveling up. Days passed as Wu hunted jackalopes, his level eventually reaching 6. However, as his level increased, the experience offered by these low-level monsters decreased. He concluded that hunting jackalopes had become pointless for gaining experience and decided it was time to hunt higher-level monsters. Although the original game design gave players only one undistributed attribute point per level. In this world, warriors typically boosted their strength, assassins honed their accuracy, and magicians elevated their intelligence. Wu pondered which attribute to enhance. As he looked up, a gigantic creature in the distance caught his eye, shocking him. It was the Jackalope King, a level 10 prairie wild boss with a horn as hard as steel. Known as a D-level creature, its special ability was Bouncing Crash. Staring at it as it consumed a boar, Wu felt a jolt of fear. The Jackalope King was the first boss he'd designed for new players in this fantasy world. With its high HP, resilient skin, and terrifying speed, it was a nightmare for novices. The only realistic strategy for rookies and low-level players was to use a bow to attack it from a distance. Regrettably, all he had was a shovel, leaving him regretting his initial design. Deciding on agility, Wu added his 6 undistributed points, raising it to 21. As a demon player, he was physically superior to an average novice. For the pride of a demon, he resolved to challenge the Jackalope King. However, he quickly retreated, jesting that he was kidding, and derided the jackalopes as a bunch of stupid rabbits. Enraged, the jackalope king bellowed. Wu retorted, questioning whether it truly thought he would fight and reminding it of his numerical disadvantage. The jackalopes emerged from their burrows, chasing after him, led by the jackalope king. The king prepared to use its bouncing crash to impale him with its horn. Wu sidestepped in the nick of time, narrowly avoiding a second attempt as well. He taunted the king, effortlessly evading its subsequent strikes, all while daring it to land a hit, his high agility allowing him to dodge effortlessly. Furious, the king summoned the jackalopes and ordered them to attack. Wu halted upon hearing the noise and turned back to see a horde of jackalopes led by the king hot on his trail, making him panic. In a stuttering voice, he alerted others that the wild boss, the Jackalope King, had appeared and advised them to retreat swiftly. However, instead of fleeing, the other players seemed thrilled at the opportunity to secure rare loot dropped by the king. They assured Wu that they'd join him, but rather than aiding him, they were also pursued by the Jackalope Pack. The players cursed Wu, but he merely grinned, excusing himself to prepare a meal for his child. He bid them farewell, leaving them baffled by his impressive speed and swearing vengeance on him for their current predicament. A few hours later, within Ma's building, he opened his apartment door and was welcomed by a cute Meng. She rushed to hug her father excitedly. He asked her what she did at home today and Meng replied that the landlady had given her a picture book. After Zhuang Wu adopted Meng Meng, landlady Ma Chun Chun often visited, helping to take care of Meng. Ma also warned him sternly not to behave improperly towards Meng. As they greeted each other cheerfully, their stomachs growled with hunger. He assured Meng that he would prepare dinner. Since becoming a father, he had learned to prepare all sorts of fried rice dishes, such as egg and dried radish fried rice, ham fried rice, tomato fried rice, and more. However, when he opened the cabinet, it was bare. He checked the refrigerator and found it was empty too, leading him to realize they had run out of food. Meng saw her father's disheartened look and tugged at Wu's shirt. She cheerfully told him that she wasn't hungry. Observing her, he was reminded that Meng's diet for the past half year had been nothing but mustard with rice, white sugar with porridge, and a single loaf of bread shared between the two of them. He apologized to Meng with a heavy heart, realizing she hadn't lived a good life since he adopted her. He asked if she wanted to eat fried chicken, to which Meng excitedly replied that she did. However, her excitement faded as she remembered something and told Wu that she didn't want it after all. When Wu asked why, she explained that if they spent too much money, he wouldn't be able to pay the rent. Wu acknowledged that he still owed Ma three months' rent, maintenance, and medical fees, but reassured Meng that they could afford a lavish feast today, even though his balance was a mere 121 RMB. He assured Meng that from that day forward, they would bid farewell to poverty. He then ordered a set of chicken that cost 120 RMB. He knew that in the post-disaster world, the player had become everyone's idol and many people admired them. These individuals either had a strong physique or unexplainable healing abilities, but most importantly, they were all wealthy, and as long as they possessed the player identity, they could enter dungeons. He also knew that unlike wild monsters, underground monsters dropped monster crystals. One E-level monster crystal could be exchanged for 500 RMB, a D-level crystal for 1000 RMB, and a C-level monster crystal for 2000 RMB. 
This made him believe that becoming a player could also make him rich. Soon, someone knocked on their door to deliver their Silver Arch family meal set. Wu and Meng ate it with fervor, tears streaming down their faces. As night fell, he tucked a sleeping Meng into bed, carefully pulling a blanket over her. He heard her mumble happily in her sleep about how lovely the French fries were. Subsequently, he returned to his computer desk and checked the chat forum. He saw news that at 4 p.m. that afternoon, the Jackalope King had appeared in the city's suburbs, causing a rabbit horde. Four players were attacked by the swarm of rabbits and hospitalized. Fortunately, they were rescued in time and their lives were no longer in danger. He was relieved that the players with him hadn't perished. If they had, he would have been plagued by guilt. The top and trending posts on the forum were all written by him. After the disaster, Wu had been doing his best to assist others in this way. To the players, Wu was akin to a god. However, there were occasional accidents, like the incident where 50 people entered the dungeon and only two survived. According to one survivor, the team leader had over-relied on the dungeon guide and had failed to adapt. Players asked if the god's guide was truly helpful, but he knew that it was his worst guiding failure ever. This failure had led to the creation of multi-level dungeons and a new boss. He understood that it was all due to the system's updates and additional content in the game. In their harsh world, even if they succeeded 99 times, a single mistake could mean the end for them. After that incident, Wu gradually stopped uploading guides. The following day, he arrived at the prairie on the outskirts of S-City. Aware of his current financial difficulties, he knew he needed to find a way to generate income. He loudly declared that he could forego a meal, but he couldn't bear to see Meng do the same. Surveying the boars nearby, he realized he was currently at level 6 and needed to reach level 10 by that morning. Therefore, he resolved to undertake the profession-changing mission venture into the underground dungeon and gather monster crystals. He also understood that those fang boars were extremely aggressive and moved in packs. They didn't drop any crystals, making hunting them a futile endeavor and this was why few players showed interest in them. However, unbeknownst to others, he had secretly included additional rewards in the game during its creation. Normally, hunting the same monster repeatedly would yield diminishing experience points, but after defeating a hundred fang boars, a player's experience would double. With his trusty shovel, he struck a level 3 fang boar cub, understanding that reaching level 10 swiftly depended on his current hunt. A notification popped up, informing him that he had successfully killed a fang boar cub, earning him 10 experience points. Energized, he continued his hunting spree. He felt a sense of pride looking at the felled boars but was taken aback when he noticed a group of massive, angry boars behind him. He fled, apologizing to the boars in hot pursuit, but they persisted. A notification indicated that his demon imitation skill had been reset. Halting his flight, he slowly turned around, addressing the boars, indicating that it was now his turn to retaliate. Activating his demon imitation skill, he leaped towards the boars, causing them to collapse in fear. He methodically finished them off with his shovel, earning 50 experience points for each boar, helping him reach level 10 with ease and triggering the profession-changing mission. Upon accessing the game's interface, he was relieved to see that he had finally achieved level 10. Although it had taken him half an hour longer than expected, he still had ample time. His demon race profession changing mission was to clear the demon wolf dungeon located on the northern side of the sky tree within 60 minutes. The demon wolf dungeon was an E-level underground dungeon, suitable for teams of 5 players who had already changed professions and had levels ranging from 10 to 20. In this new fantasy world, there were two types of dungeons, underground dungeons and fixed underground dungeons. Fixed underground dungeons had set locations and physical gates. The monsters within these dungeons could not escape, and once players cleared these dungeons, they would open. On the other hand, random underground dungeons were spatial cracks that could randomly appear in the wilderness or the city. If left uncleared for too long, the monsters could exit these dungeons and invade the earth. Moreover, these dungeons would vanish once players had cleared them. He felt the difficulty of the profession changing mission was hellish and suspected that the system was intentionally targeting him. After humanity had unleashed nuclear weapons on the sky tree, it formed a circular defense shield that blocked all technological devices. If a car approached the sky tree, it would spontaneously combust. If a battle jet flew into the shield, it would lose its propulsion, and no signals could penetrate the shield. Thus, horse-drawn carriages were the most common mode of transportation around the sky tree, offered free of charge by the Management Association for Players. Climbing into a carriage, he admired the picturesque prairie, reflecting that nature could thrive better without human interference. Eventually, they reached their destination, and he was elated to finally arrive at the Demon Wolf Dungeon. As was the case in many MMORPG games, some players would halt their level progression to assist other players in exchange for money. These players advertised themselves as a carry team and promised to provide crystals and equipment to those willing to join them. 
Understanding the need to clear his mission within an hour, he contemplated enlisting some players to aid him. One player informed him they had a slot available and asked if he wished to join. When he inquired about the cost, the player responded that it was 20,000 RMB per journey, with a promotional offer of 6 rides for the price of 5. The price stunned him, and he declined. He then noticed the group he had previously seen. Their levels seemed to have increased, and they were equipped with superior gear. Suddenly, Chen Xin, level 19, approached him, causing him to panic and hastily open his inventory. He knew he had to prevent them from recognizing him. Chen Xin mentioned that their team consisted of four players and needed one more. He then asked if he would like to join them. He looked up, donning a mask, which prompted Chen Xin to ask why he was wearing it. He explained that he was a miner, a profession dedicated to mining monster crystals within dungeons, and typically did not engage in battles. Chen Xin reassured him that his profession was not an issue and he could join them. Chen Xin also mentioned that the equipment loot would be divided amongst the four original members, but they would distribute the crystals equally with him. Relieved they had not recognized him, he considered that their team's levels and equipment were on par with those of the carry teams. He concluded it was beneficial to ally with them and agreed to Chen Xin's proposition. Together, they opened the dungeon gate, greeted by pitch black darkness. Since the sky tree inhibited all technological devices, they relied on torches for illumination instead of flashlights. Holding their torches, they ventured further into the dungeon, and he activates his demon's eyes. They notice shining crystals embedded in the ground and the walls. Kai Ziaozhong, level 18, was eager to collect the monster crystals, but Chen Xin cautioned him against it. A wolf emerged from the dark, its red eyes glaring at them with hostility. It was a level 12 armored demon wolf. Chen Xin warned his team about the armored demon wolves and instructed them to ready themselves for battle while he drew the wolves' attention. One of the wolves lunged to attack them, but they released an arrow and struck it just as Chen Xin was closing in on it. Subsequently, Chen Xin decapitated it. Another wolf pounced on Chen Xin, but luckily Qi Zhen Zai unleashed her magic in time, striking the wolf before it could attack Chen Xin. Chen Xin informed his team that both demon wolves had been dispatched and advised them to restore their energy before moving forward. He then addressed Wu, warning him about the dangers ahead and suggesting that he stay behind to mine. Then Chen Xin's team proceeded to continue, leaving him thinking that even though Chen Xin's group had good equipment, it was impossible for them to clear the demon wolf dungeon within an hour. He started digging with his shovel, knowing that the boss was very close to the entrance, just right underneath him. A minute later, his shovel reached the underground. He descended using a rope, but as soon as he set foot on the ground, he was greeted by a wolf. Looking up, he was stunned to see it. The wolf leapt to attack him. Fortunately, he dodged it, but suffered 10 points of damage from its sharp claws. He looked back and saw that the wolf had crashed on the ground. He opened his inventory, aware that at times like these, he had to use it. Then he showed the wolf the dead jackalope, surprising it. The wolf's fierceness immediately changed into puppy-like behavior upon seeing the jackalope. He threw the bunny to it, knowing that the armored demon wolves, living in dungeons, had a poor diet and were irresistibly drawn towards jackalopes. He took his chance and continuously stabbed the armored wolf's belly, knowing that its weak point was the stomach. Then a notification popped up, informing him that he had killed an armored demon wolf and obtained 100 experience points. He was glad that he gained a lot of experience and could also get a crystal, so he decided he should level up there. Suddenly, he heard something approaching from behind him. Turning around, he saw a swarm of wolves heading towards him. As they were about to attack him, he immediately jumped to the rope, shouting that he forgot the jackalope's smell would attract demon wolves. He ascended the rope swiftly, bidding farewell to the wolves. Once he reached the top, he told the wolves they couldn't follow him up there, but the wolves ran away, making him wonder why they left. He peeked at where the wolves had run and saw that they were surrounding Chen Xin's group. He felt genuinely sorry for the four of them, but he figured since they could survive the Jackalope King's attack, demon wolves shouldn't pose much of a problem. Xiao Zhang aimed his arrow and released it, stabbing a wolf in the eye. He then asked Chen Xin what was wrong with the underground dungeon and why there were so many armored demon wolves. But before Chen Xin could reply, the wolf that Xiao Zhang had injured pushed him to the ground and bit his arm. Looking closer, he saw that it was in berserk mode, making him wonder why the wolves were behaving this way when they hadn't provoked them. Chen Xin swung his sword at the wolf attacking Xiao Zhang while shouting at his group to focus on their duty and not to be dazed. Chen Xin called Jin Yun Kang and ordered him to heal Xiao Zhang first, to which Yun Kang immediately obeyed. Chen Xin then approached Qi Zhen Zai and ordered her to cast explosive fireballs at the wolves. Yun Kang wondered if they were cursed. Not long ago, they were hospitalized because of the Jackalope King and had just been discharged, but strange occurrences began to happen again in the E-level dungeon. Zhen Zai cast a fireball and attacked the wolves with it, 
but the wolves avoided it in time and leapt towards them to attack. Zen Zai told Chen Xin that there were too many demon wolves and suggested that they should retreat. Chen Xin blocked one of the wolf attacks and shouted for his group to retreat and cover Zen Zai while she cast fireballs. But before they could retreat, they heard a loud growl and when they looked up, they saw a huge wolf glaring at them. The other wolves surrounded them, pinning them in the center. Yun Kang fearfully told his team they were doomed and Xiao Zhang asked his team if the huge wolf was the demon wolf leader of the second floor gatekeeper and why it had come to the first floor. On the other hand, Wu was relaxedly digging into the ground. He was happy because the boss's room was right below him, but he stopped when he heard a loud growl from the first floor. He thought the four of them had good equipment and they should be fine, but he decided to take a look because he knew that the mission could wait, but it would be bad if Chen Xin's group died. He remembered that he had almost caused their deaths once. He quietly walked towards where the growl was coming from and saw that Chen Xin's group was surrounded by wolves. He planned to help them by luring the demon wolf leader away, thinking they should be able to deal with the remaining armored demon wolves. Suddenly, a bright red light shone from them, making him wonder what it was. Chen Xin revealed a weapon, shimmering brightly, an artifact known as the Fire Lizard's Madness Flame Dagger. This level D artifact imbues the wielder with flames. Its effects boost defense, attack, and recovery rate by 50% and last for 60 minutes, but are only available to players below level 20. Wu recognized this as a rare item dropped by the underground dungeon boss, which would usually disappear after a single use. Xiao Zhang informed Chen Xin that they had spent half a year's savings on it. Yun Kang pointed out that if others knew they'd used a D-level artifact in an E-level dungeon, they'd be mocked mercilessly. Chen Xin, however, retorted that they should wait until they had survived the ordeal to discuss it further. From a distance, Wu acknowledged that they didn't require his help. He knew that the D-level artifact could fetch at least 500,000 at the auction house, yet it was reserved for emergencies. Chen Xin's group was the first ever to employ a D-level artifact in an E-level dungeon. Checking the countdown of his mission, Wu noted there was only half an hour remaining. He needed to move swiftly. A minute later, he had finished digging the last underground passage and carefully descended. Landing in the Demon Wolf Dungeon boss room, he assessed his adversaries. The first monster, Double-Headed Wolf Thors, was a level 20 Demon Wolf Dungeon Elite, known for its extreme cruelty. It was an E-level creature with a special ability known as Tear. The second creature, the boss monster named Half-Beastman Luka, was a level 25 with 2000 HP. Once a half-beastman chieftain, Luca had become corrupted and assumed the role of the demon wolf dungeon boss. As a D-rank entity, his weapon of choice was a large axe. In an effort to make the exploration of this new fantasy world more exhilarating, Wu had sprinkled checkpoints and easter eggs throughout the game. One significant easter egg in the demon wolf dungeon allowed players to reach the boss room without engaging in combat. Following the usual route, players would only reach the door of the boss room. However, Wu had dug a hole directly into the boss room to avoid waking the boss. He opened his inventory to find a roasted pig. Combining it with sleeping mushrooms, potent sleeping pills, and alcohol, he fashioned a sure sleeping medicine roasted pig. Slowly and deliberately, he approached the slumbering double-headed wolf with the doctored meal. He placed it near the wolf and hastily retreated. Awoken by Wu's movement, the wolf was taken aback by the sight of the roasted pig. One of its heads eagerly bit into the meal, causing the other head to grow angry and bite its counterpart. As the two heads bickered, Wu contemplated whether he should have brought two roasted pigs. Silently praying that the noisy dispute wouldn't awaken the boss, he anticipated the imminent onset of the sleeping medicine's effects. After a few tense minutes, the double-headed wolf collapsed, indicating the sure sleeping medicine roasted pig had taken effect. Wu quietly approached half-beastman Luka, knowing that despite its less potent physical power compared to the wolf, it maintained control through its D-level large axe and tornado dance slash skill. The weapon, named Half-Beastman's Large Axe, had an attack power range of 35 to 50. Its special ability was the Tornado Dance Slash, with a cooldown period of 30 minutes. This artifact, a treasured heirloom of the Beastman tribe, was meant to be owned by the Beastman Chieftain. However, after becoming corrupt, Luca had stolen it and removed it from the tribe's domain. The weapon required a usage level of 25. Incredulous that he had set the requirement at level 25, Wu crept towards the axe, mumbling about wanting to punch himself. However, he froze as the boss stirred awake. Swiftly, he stashed the axe in his inventory. The boss prepares its fists, aiming for Wu, who managed to dodge. Still, the debris from the impact damaged him by 20 HP. Wary of the potent attack, Wu realized that a direct hit could have cost him half his HP. As the boss lunged again, Wu dodged and then sprinted away, pleading for a break to apply his buffs. He opened his inventory, consumed Lao Zhang's spicy rabbit head to boost his speed by 5% for 5 minutes, then activated his Bunny Slayer title skill, increasing his Berserk strength by 10% for 10 minutes. 
Brandishing two shovels, he turned to face the boss, declaring the chase over. As the angry boss approached, a notification popped up, revealing only 14 minutes remained to complete the mission. Recognizing it was time for action, Wu prepared for the offensive. They were facing each other while the double-headed wolf slept peacefully on the side. The creature lunged a fist to attack him, but he blocked it deftly with the head of his shovel. Gripping his shovel tightly, he slashed at the creature, dealing 15 points of damage. He quickly realized that the damage inflicted had no effect. To defeat the monster, he would need to land 200 hits of the same magnitude. For a team, this task wouldn't be difficult. If there was a warrior who could absorb the boss's strikes and provoke it, the other members could continuously attack. But at that moment, he was alone, and he had no time to provoke the boss. The beast picked up a large stone from the ground and hurled it at him. He couldn't dodge it, the stone was too fast. It hit him, and he suffered 60 points of damage. Leaning against the wall, he was surprised that the boss had a throwing skill. It seemed that the system had modified the beast, this was not the boss he was familiar with. The creature grabbed the chain of the double-headed wolf, making him wonder why it had stopped attacking him. Suddenly, half-beastman Luca slapped the wolf repeatedly, surprising him. He opened the interface, berating the boss for its cowardice. He was fighting it alone, yet it wanted to call its teammate for help. Looking at his remaining points, he knew he couldn't let it wake the double-headed wolf. But even if he invested all his remaining points into strength, it wouldn't help much. Still, he needed to survive, so he risked it all, putting his remaining stats into agility. He thought he might currently be the most agile level 10 player. He ran towards the boss, stabbing it with his two shovels, dealing 18 and 20 points of damage. The beast growled furiously, attacking him with its sharp claws. He deftly rolled into the air to dodge the attack, extinguishing the torches in the process. Landing, he told the panic-stricken boss that it had been a false attack. His original plan was to extinguish the torches, for in darkness, his demon eyes gave him a significant advantage. Confused and wary, the boss felt the eyes behind it, and immediately turned to block his attack from behind. Frustrated that it could still sense his attack, he spun in the air, shouting that the fight wasn't over yet. He slashed and stabbed its neck, dealing 130 points of damage by hitting its weak point. The beast's current HP dropped to 1817 out of 2000. The creature punched back at him, but he disappeared swiftly. As it looked around, a shovel was launched at it. He stabbed at its weak point, the kneecap, slowing it down. Seizing the opportunity, he stabbed at its other weak point, the eye, reducing its eyesight. He dealt 120 points of damage. He stepped back as the beast collapsed on the ground, thinking about how effective his stealth attacks were in the dark. He ran towards the creature to continue attacking, but it reached for the chain on the ground, swinging it in a fit of anger. Unfortunately, the chain struck him in the stomach, throwing him harshly to the ground. He took 75 points of damage, leaving him with a meager 100 out of 250 HP. Painfully, he opened his inventory, cursing in anger. He grabbed his medicine just as the creature attacked again. He ran, the system warning him that the creature was adapting to the dark. He drank a mid-level healing potion, set to recover 100 HP within 10 seconds. Once his recovery was complete, he stopped running and faced the beast, ready to continue the attack. He leaped and struck its head with his shovel, then continuously hit it in the face, shoulder, hand, and chin, until its HP dropped to 650 out of 2000. Suddenly, a notification popped up in front of him, stating that the HP of the Demon Wolf Dungeon's boss, Half-Beastman Luca, had fallen to a third, and it was entering Berserk Mode. A few seconds later, it entered Berserk Mode, and a notification popped up, warning him that he was being locked on. Swiftly, it launched its fist in an attempt to punch him. He blocked the blow with his shovel, unable to dodge, but his shovel was shattered, and the fist struck him directly in the stomach. Thrown back, he slammed into the wall hard, suffering 100 points of critical damage. Though badly injured, he understood that one more hit could potentially be fatal. Suddenly, it was on top of him, poised to deliver a killing blow, but he rolled aside in the nick of time. He then stood up and ran, taunting his foe by asserting that he too could enter Berserk mode. Opening the notification, he saw that he only had 4 minutes and 30 seconds to complete the mission, and his Berserk skill would be ready in another 12 seconds. Activating his trump card, he selected his Demon Race Transformation skill, as he was gradually enveloped and transformed into a demon form. His stats temporarily increased by 20%. The transformation lasted only 29 seconds, but during that time, his energy overflowed, and he believed that in his demon form, he might even be able to defeat a level 30 player alone. Beastman Luca, though in a berserk state, could still feel fear. In its eyes, Wu had become monstrous, huge, and formidable. It picked up stones and hurled them continuously, 
but Wu merely walked calmly towards it. When a massive stone was about to hit him, he caught it with one hand and crushed it. He then asked Beastman Luka if it was prepared for the beating that was about to come. Leaping into the air, Wu closed the distance to Beastman Luka, teasingly telling it to taste his serious punch. He then punched it hard in the face and chin. Each punch inflicted damage ranging from 130 to 170. He was aware that his state granted him immense power, but the duration was extremely short, a mere 30 seconds. If he failed to defeat Boss Luka within this time, the tables could turn again, so he couldn't afford to let his foe recover. Meanwhile, on the first floor of the Demon Wolf dungeon, Chen Xin and his group lay exhausted. Xiao Zhang expressed relief at their victory, while Zhen Zai warned that her magic wand was on the brink of breaking. Suddenly, a loud growl surprised them. Xiao Zhang panicked, asking about the sound and whether there could be more problems. However, Zhen Zai I surmised it was likely a monster fight happening below them. Chen Xin instructed his team to rest and stay alert. A minute later, they proceeded to the boss room, but a notification congratulated them for clearing the Demon Wolf dungeon and eliminating the boss, Half Beastman Luka. A puzzled Xiao Zhang asked his team how they had cleared the dungeon so effortlessly. On the other hand, in the Demon Wolf dungeon's boss room, Wu leveled up three times. The notification congratulated him for completing the Demon Profession Change mission. He was exhausted but relieved it was over. He then opened his inventory to check the boss drops, noticing an item called Weird Necklace of Unknown Level, Effect, and rarity level, but he inferred it was of high quality. He was pleased to see many magic crystals but was surprised to find a perfect quality blue crystal. He knew the ranks of crystals were divided into three sections, normal, pure, and perfect. The D-rank normal blue magic crystal had dim light and poor quality, while the D-rank pure blue magic crystal was brighter and of higher quality. The D-rank perfect blue magic crystal was even brighter, similar to a precious gem. Knowing its high value, he envisioned himself and Meng enjoying a lavish meal. Meng happily told him she loved her dad the most, making him really happy. He sighed at his broken shovels, realizing he needed to find a craftsman to make him a sturdy weapon. He was certain he had become accustomed to using a shovel. Holding the necklace from his inventory, he pondered why he was unable to appraise it and whether the game had added the necklace. Suddenly, he heard footsteps approaching the room where the double-headed wolf was sleeping peacefully. However, it stirred and raised its body, preparing to stand. He knew the game setting well, once the stone door was pushed open. Thor's, the double-headed wolf, would awaken. Frustratingly, even a surefire sleeping potion wouldn't work on Thor's under these conditions. He muttered under his breath, cursing the designer who set up this system, but realized he needed to make a quick escape before the wolf noticed him. Swiftly, he leapt to a hanging rope, his exit strategy, and decided to let Chen Xin's group handle Thor's as he had already eliminated the boss. Seconds later, the group opened the boss room door, puzzled to find the boss already defeated even though they hadn't yet opened the stone door. Gen Zai remarked on the mysterious and strange nature of the dungeon, adding to their surprise. Their shock deepened as they discovered the half-beastman, Luka, dead on the ground. Xiao Zhang speculated that the double-headed wolf could have betrayed and killed the boss. Upon hearing this, the wolf, enraged, attacked them. They exclaimed that the dungeon was not only strange but also insane. Eventually, they managed to eliminate Thor's, the double-headed wolf. Xiao Zhang admitted to his team that their venture into the dungeon had yielded a negative profit. They had lost an artifact, obtained only a few E-rank magic crystals and some trash items, and didn't even secure a decent weapon. Suddenly, a notification appeared before Chen Xin, indicating that their clear time for the demon wolf dungeon was 58 minutes and 2 seconds, breaking the previous record. The system was set to globally announce this news, and it asked them if they wished to conceal their identity. They were momentarily speechless, but Chen Xin chose not to hide their identities. The notification then inquired if they wanted to give their squad a cool name. Chen Xia suggested Flame Lizard Squad. Shortly after, a global announcement congratulated the Flame Lizard Squad, Shen Chen Xin, Kai Zio Zhang, Qi Jin Zai, Jai Yun Kang, and Zhuang Wu for breaking the Demon Wolf Dungeon's record with a clear time of 58 minutes and 2 seconds. Each team member received the Wolf Hunter title. Upon reading the announcement, other players were impressed. Even though they knew the squad had used artifacts, they were still astounded by the short 58-minute completion time. Zio Zhang told Chen Xin that their fame could secure them spots in some top guilds. The interface informed them that the Wolf Hunter title, which increased their attack power by 7%, was earned by clearing the Demon Wolf Dungeon within an hour. They noticed Wu hydrating on the first floor and speculated that he must have scored big in the dungeon. They also spotted a few crystals on the ground. Xiao Zhang was annoyed, accusing Wu of digging for so long only to unearth so few. Wu apologized, explaining that all his shovels had broken. But Xiao Zhang still berated him. 
he complained about their rotten luck, dealing with an incompetent digger, and how the small number of magic crystals couldn't even cover the cost of the potions they used. Xiao Zhang reminded Wu that they had allowed him to get the title for free, so they claimed all the magic crystals and left him behind. However, Zhen Zai turned back, telling him to wait. She handed him a crystal as promised. He thanked her, asking her name and if she would be willing to exchange phone numbers. She introduced herself as Qi Zhen Zai and gave him her number. Zhen Zai advised him to leave the dungeon quickly as it was about to close, which he agreed with. Outside the dungeon, the players were puzzled as to why the squad hadn't exited yet. When the door slowly opened, a cheer erupted from the crowd. They swarmed the squad, extending guild invitations, attempting to buy dungeon clearing secrets, and offering to purchase any valuable items they might have obtained. Preferring solitude to crowded spaces, he slipped away unnoticed, leaving Chen Xin's group and the crowd at the dungeon gate behind. He found a quiet spot to stop, confident that he wouldn't be disturbed. He opened the game interface, aware that he had completed the profession change mission, which meant he could now change professions. He knew that demon warriors were known for their strength and defense, with bodies as hard as stone that few weapons could damage. Demon hunters, on the other hand, had extremely high agility and attack power, capable of converting all agility into attack power, terrifying their enemies. Lastly, demon warlocks were renowned for their powerful souls, expertise in various healing spells, and ability to summon death spirits and skeletons. A powerful demon warlock could single-handedly take on an entire army. Being a Lyra, he often struggled with decision-making. He understood that a demon warrior was essentially a tank, a demon hunter was akin to an offensive assassin, and a demon warlock was more of a summoner. He wished he could select all three and wondered if that was possible. The notification informed him that he could only choose one profession unless he obtained a hero certificate, which would allow an additional profession. He suspected that securing a hero certificate would require the goddess's help, but he decided against seeking her out for the time being, as he feared her wrath upon seeing him. He opted for the demon hunter, believing it was the most suitable for him, as it allowed him to convert all his agility to attack power when necessary. A bright light enveloped him as the notification confirmed his change of profession to demon hunter, indicating that his attributes had been altered. His current level was 13, with 120 experience points out of 38 o needed for the next level. He held the titles of rabbit hunter and wolf hunter. His health points were 300, mana points 150, and his strength and agility had increased by 28, physique by 14, wisdom by 12, sense by 13, with 3 undistributed attribute points remaining. He also obtained a new skill called Hunt Mark, which allowed the demon hunter to tag a target. Within the mark's duration, the hunter would be aware of the target's location, deal double damage to the monster, and discern its weak point upon attack. This ability could only mark one target at a time, but upon killing the marked target, the Hunt Mark skill's cooldown would reset. Failure to kill the target would trigger a 24-hour cooldown, and activating the skill required 50 mana points. He was thrilled to acquire the Hunt Mark skill, considering it exceptionally useful for solo duels. Meanwhile, at the Player Association Management Center, Bing Yun reported to Lei Q that the Goddess Martial Artist Guild was engaged in large-scale combat at the Skyline Tree's western battleground against Dark Elves. Tragically, 40 players had died, the Goddess Martial Artist went missing, and the clan's co-leader was killed. The Goddess Martial Artist Guild is a unique profession. It is a battle-oriented guild under direct military jurisdiction. They typically abstain from dungeon raids, preferring to fight monsters on the front line. When Lei Q inquired about how widespread the knowledge of this incident was, Bing Yun assured him that, to prevent chaos and panic, the information had been contained. Lei Q's concern deepened when Bing Yun informed him that the higher-ups wished for them to dispatch other player guilds to the front line to provide support. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of S City, a man was riding in a carriage passing through the Sky Tree Shield. As they crossed the barrier, his phone began to ring incessantly. Retrieving his phone, he noticed he had regained signal and saw a series of angry messages from Ma. She criticized him for his negligence as a guardian and informed him that Meng was ill and needed to be taken to the hospital. Later, at S City's central hospital, Ma was peeling an apple beside a sickly Meng, who was resting on the bed. Wu burst through the door, anxiously asking about Meng's condition. Ma, clutching the fruit knife tightly, admonished him to speak quietly, as Meng had just fallen asleep. Ma questioned his whereabouts over the past two days, pointing out that he hadn't noticed Meng's high fever. Wu replied that he had been busy trying to earn money. Upon being asked about his success, he excitedly told Ma that he had indeed managed to earn some. He expressed his relief at finally being able to pay the rent, medical fees, water leak repairs, and the cost of the TV that Meng had damaged. 
Skeptically, Ma pointed out that as his landlord for many years, she had only seen him accrue losses and had never seen him make any money. Wu then produced the perfect blue crystals from his inventory and suggested that she sell them, believing it would suffice. Ma questioned if he had been to the dungeons, but Wu merely replied that he wanted to be a miner. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. A nurse asked which of them was a family member of Meng, as Dr. Zhu had some information to share. Both Wu and Ma responded simultaneously. After a moment of speechless mutual surprise, Wu suggested that he should go. A few minutes later, he found himself in Dr. Zhu's office. The doctor solemnly advised him to brace himself before handing over Meng's diagnosis. Stunned, Wu read the diagnosis revealing high levels of magic elements in Meng's body, consistent with magic element syndrome. Once, cancer was humanity's greatest health fear, now, in the new era, magic element syndrome had assumed that role. Ever since the game invaded Earth, the air had been composed not only of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, but also a new particle known as a magic element. Most people remained unaffected by the magic element, but some bodies absorbed it from the air, causing an accumulation of magic elements that had numerous negative effects. These included continuous high fever, excessive sleepiness, loss of appetite, and even the appearance of black dots. Dr. Zhu informed Wu that current medicine couldn't cure the syndrome, only protective treatment was possible. However, given Meng's body had 10 times more magic elements than the average patient, he feared even this may not be effective. Devastated, Wu sat on a bench clutching Meng's diagnosis. He understood that it was already a miracle that Meng was alive. However, he knew he couldn't surrender so easily. He decided to raid the burial ground, where there was a chance to find Lasso's Tears, an S-rank item that could cure all illnesses. Named after the goddess of light and hope from the stories, it was rumored that her tears could cure any ailment. Such a curative item could only be found in the burial ground, a place that represented death. The dungeon had a difficulty level of C, a level restriction of 10 to 30, and only a single party capacity. He understood they couldn't form a team and would have to tackle the dungeon solo. Most players wouldn't be able to clear the dungeon, but he was confident that he wasn't the weakling who could only defeat horn rabbits any longer. He returned to Meng's room, and Ma asked him with concern about the doctor's diagnosis, and if Meng was all right. He explained it was just a normal fever, but the doctor said the money for the medical fees wasn't sufficient, and thus he needed to pay more. Outraged, Ma argued that they had already paid $3,000 that morning. She questioned whether they had exhausted their funds in less than a day. Ma reassured him that if money was tight, the rental fee could wait until after Meng had recovered. As Wu broke down in tears, he acknowledged Ma's kindness. Yet Ma replied that if it weren't for Meng, she would have evicted him long ago. Chiding him, she tapped him on his back and mentioned that he was covered in dirt. She insisted he should not touch her and go clean up quickly, as she intended to take care of Meng for the night. He realized he was covered in dust and sand from digging holes in the Demon Wolf dungeon, where he had also battled the boss. Consequently, his entire body was battered and dirty. Acknowledging Ma's advice, he said he would take a bath first. However, Ma impatiently told him to leave. Later, while showering, he realized that after joining the Demon Race, his body had changed. He had developed a potent urge to destroy things. Despite only being level 13, his attributes exceeded those of most level 20 players. Using the hunt mark skill, he could solo a D-ranked dungeon without worries. However, he knew soloing a C-ranked dungeon would be challenging, so he needed to enhance his overall combat ability. After his contemplation, he stepped outside. S City's Chang'an Street was a bustling business district where players bought and sold weapons. As he strolled down the street, he heard a caged monster wailing. The seller was convincing a lady that the pet they were selling was exceptionally safe. Then he pushed a button while instructing the lady to do the same. The monster got electrocuted and collapsed in its cage, severely injured. The seller assured the lady that in addition to the electric collar, they had removed all of its fangs to prevent it from biting people. Satisfied, the lady agreed to make the purchase. He knew the earth was no longer what it used to be, yet humans remained the same. A minute later, he reached the Magic Crystal Exchange store. Looking at the exchange rate of crystals, he noticed a drop. Other players expressed frustration too, but they understood that they had no option as more and more players raided dungeons. He opened his inventory and retrieved several crystals. The employee greeted him and explained that the current price for E-rank Magic Crystals was 455, and D-rank was 965. He then asked if he was sure he wanted to proceed with the exchange. Pausing, he told the employee he had another magic crystal. Upon showing it, he inquired about its worth. The employee was surprised to see it and carefully examined it. He was informed it was a D-rank perfect magic crystal. Suddenly, a man behind him lamented that it was only a D-rank perfect magic crystal, good for crafting only a D-rank weapon. The man added that half a year ago, such a crystal would have been in high demand and worth more, with people clamoring to purchase it. The employee offered $10,000 for the crystal and asked his opinion. 
he agreed, stating it was not a problem. The employee thanked him for his business and assured him the payment would be transferred right away. After deducting the tax, a total of $133,200 was deposited into his account. Later, he visited Lao Kao's weapon store. He browsed around and noticed a Wind Frost's long sword priced at $55,000, and a water crystal dagger costing $95,000. He exited the shop, loudly criticizing it for lacking elite equipment. However, the reality was he simply couldn't afford it. While walking down the street, he spotted shining blades lying on the ground. He picked them up, recognizing them as Baldur's Curse Swords. With an attack power of 1445, it was a B-rank weapon with no level restriction. It could inflict additional damage on death spirits and could absorb death souls to enhance the weapon's attack power up to a maximum of 20 stacks. A human wielding the weapon would lose 10% HP. The sword was originally the god of light Baldur's, created from a type of parasitic tree's branches found around the Divine Land. After Baldur was betrayed by the gods, his weapon became cursed. Astounded by the three effects of the sword, he asked the seller about the price. The seller quoted $15,000. He argued that the weapon was not suitable for humans and questioned if the price wasn't too high. But the seller countered, stating it was a B-rank weapon and if he didn't want it, he was free to leave. He then pulled out a large axe from his inventory and asked the seller if he would consider a trade. The seller held the large sword and noted his axe was only D-rank. However, the seller agreed to the trade, admitting he had been trying to sell the sword for several days. As he walked away, the seller laughed at his perceived victory, thinking he had made a fantastic deal. Wu knew if the seller realized he wasn't human, he might have been shocked into unconsciousness. Still, the seller believed he had made a fortune and considered the axe a good trade. Later, he arrived at the hospital and found Meng and Ma asleep. He gently covered Ma with a blanket and walked to the nurse's station. He requested the nurse to upgrade room 27 to a VIP sickroom. Well guys, that's the end of the video, if you like this video comment part 2 in the comment section. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.